Hello and welcome back to Materials Kinetics. We are in chapter four, uh, which is analytical solutions of the diffusion equation. So let me share my screen and I will bring up the lecture slides for chapter four. All right, so what we're going to cover today is a fixed second law with constant diffusivity. We're going to cover several different methods of deriving closed form analytical solutions of the diffusion equation, uh, starting with a plane source in one dimension. Then we're going to cover the method of reflection and superposition, which is a simple extension of that. Solution for a finite source, error function solutions, and uh, the method of separation of variables, Laplace transform method, uh, how to solve the diffusion equation with Laplace transforms, and then we will end with some special cases of anisotropic diffusion, where the diffusi diffusivity is a function of direction, diffusivity as a function of concentration, as a function of time, and also diffusion in different coordinate systems, including cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. Uh, recall from last time in chapter three that fixed second law, it can be written in its most general form as shown here, where you've got the uh, time derivative of the concentration is equal to the divergence of the product of the diffusion coefficient and the gradient of the uh, concentration. So we can write this, if we have a constant diffusion coefficient d, the d can be brought out in front uh, as shown here, and then the divergence of the gradient operator is simply the Laplacian operator here, which is represented by this upside down triangle squared. If we are in three-dimensional Cartesian space, then we can write out this Laplacian operator in terms of the summation of the second spatial derivatives of the concentration. So the, the second partial derivative of concentration with respect to x, y, and z, sum those up multiplied by the diffusion coefficient d, and that's equal to the time derivative of the concentration. So this equation mathematically is a second order linear differential equation uh, and solutions exist for a large class of both initial and boundary conditions. Uh, we're going to cover the uh, pen and paper solutions today. Uh, however, uh, in many cases, it's, it's not too difficult to construct a problem that uh, does not lend itself easily to analytical solutions. And in such cases, we, meet, we must go to numerical solutions of the diffusion equation, which is what we're going to cover in chapter six. Um, so if we start now with a plane source in one dimension, uh, this is the, uh, the format of fixed second law in this one spatial uh, dimension X. Um, this has a standard solution by inspection uh, of a Gaussian form. Uh, the solution is shown here. So the concentration C as a function of position X and time T is equal to some unknown constant A divided by the square root of time times this uh, Gaussian factor, this exponential of minus X squared over 4 DT. Anytime you've got an e to the minus variable squared, that is um, a Gaussian format for the function. So what we need to do is, uh, when we have solution by inspection, is to take this proposed solution and stick it in both sides of the equation, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation, and show that both, hand, both sides of the equation are equal to each other. Then we must determine the value of this unknown constant a. So let's start. We've got our proposed solution here, and we've got the equation that we need to check in the upper right. Um, so we need to plug this first into the left-hand side of the equation, which is the time derivative. When we take the time derivative of this function, you see that there's a time dependence in the prefactor out in front, as well as a time dependence in the exponential itself. Since we have two factors here that both have time dependence, that means we need to apply the product rule when taking the derivative. So we've got the, um, the function out in front here, this a times time to the minus one half power uh, times the time derivative of the Gaussian function here, the partial of this Gaussian function with respect to time. And then uh, 
to that, we add the Gaussian function here times the time derivative of the uh, prefactor function out in front. Uh, so performing those derivatives, we perform the derivative here on the exponential and obtain this term here. Perform the derivative on this a t to the minus one half power. This picks up a t to the minus three halves power term here. And you'll note that there are like factors across both, both of these terms. The Gaussian factors here, e to the minus x squared over 4 dt, are shared by both of those terms. And we can also um, put out an a over t to the 3 halves power in front. And then we obtain, combining those like terms, we obtain this as the formula for the left-hand side of the equation after taking the time derivative of the proposed um, solution. Now what we need to do is do the same thing on the right-hand side of the equation. This involves taking the second spatial derivative of our proposed solution of the concentration function and multiplying it by the diffusion coefficient. The first derivative here is easier because there's no x dependence out in front. The only x dependence is within the argument of the exponential itself. So we just need to take the uh, derivative of this argument of the exponential multiplied by uh, the exponential function itself. And this gives us the first spatial derivative of the concentration. Now for the second derivative, this is where we have to use um, the product rule because here we have an x dependence out in front of the first derivative, as well as an x dependence in this Gaussian function. So applying the product rule then gives us two terms in the second derivative. And again, we can um, combine uh, like terms here. We've got a common factor of e to the minus x squared over 4 dt in both of these terms. We can pull out a common factor of a over t to the 3 halves power. Uh, multiplying by the diffusion coefficient here, d, uh, allows us to stick this um, diffusion coefficient here in the denominator and eliminate the other one in this second term. And when we combine those like factors together, we see indeed we get exactly the same form on the right-hand side of the equation as we obtained on the previous slide with the time derivative. So we can take out our big green marker and put a check mark there uh, we did a good job in that our proposed solution is, in fact, a valid mathematical solution to this equation. Now, the next part is that we need to determine the value of this unknown constant, A. Um, and to do that, we are going to apply our condition that the total amount of the diffusing species is held constant as M. So this capital M here uh, denotes the total amount of the diffusing species. And this is equal to the integral of our concentration integrated over all space from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, and this is held constant for any time. So taking our solution of the equation here for concentration, sticking it into this formula, what we have is the integral of our Gaussian solution from minus infinity to infinity. And now we need to solve this integral to express A in terms of M. Now, what we need to do when we integrate Gaussian functions like this is to make a substitution of variables such that we can get this Gaussian into the format shown here at the bottom, where we want this to be the integral of e to the minus variable squared uh, integrated over that variable. So to do that, we need to make a substitution of variables by introducing a new variable, which here is denoted as C where c squared is equal to x squared over 4 dt. So when we make the substitution in the argument of the exponential, this simply becomes e to the minus uh, c squared. And then this integral is just um, over that simplified function. Now, in order to do this, we must also apply the substitution of variables to this differential here. So this dx, when we take the derivative of this equation, dx is equal to 2 times the square root of dt times d c. And so we can take this, substitute this in for dx. The final thing that we have to check is the, the limits of the integral. And so as x goes to minus infinity, c also goes to minus infinity. So the lower limit is the same. And as x goes to 
positive infinity, because c also goes to positive infinity. So the limits of the integral stay the same. And now we have that the total amount of the diffusing species, capital M, is equal to 2a times the square root of d, times the integral from minus infinity to infinity uh, of the exponential of minus c squared d c. Now, this integral is a well-known integral that comes from probability and statistics. The, the Gaussian distribution is, of course, the same thing as the normal distribution. And if you take this um, non-normalized distribution here and integrate it over all space, what you get is the square root of pi. So this integral here is simply the square root of pi. And therefore, this total amount of the diffusing matter is equal to 2a times the square root of pi d. Now what we need to do is solve for a in terms of m. So that is straightforward now. a is just equal to m over 2 times the square root of pi d. So we take this equation for a, and we need to plug it into our uh, proposed solution. And when we do that, we get the final solution um, for diffusion from a plane source. And that is that the concentration as a function of the position x and time t is equal to capital M, the total amount of the diffusing species, over 2 times the square root of pi dt times e to the minus x squared over 4 dt. And we can see what that looks like if we plot it. Um, here, this plot is done on a normalized y-axis where the concentration is normalized by the total amount of the diffusing species A. And then the position here is given by x. In the limit of zero time, this just becomes a Dirac delta function uh, because all of the diffusing matter is concentrated into that position at x equals zero. And then if you um, allow the system to evolve over some finite time, it spreads out from that plane source. So at the short time shown here, for dt equals 1 16th, you can see that it is spread out and follows the Gaussian function as shown in the blue curve. If you wait longer, it goes to the orange curve and then to the gray curve, where it just um, spreads out more and more. But in each case, if you integrate any of these curves over all, all space, that integral gives you the total amount of the diffusing species. And so that integral remains constant under these conditions. Now, the next method is going to be the method of reflection and superposition. And there, what we do is we assume that there is some sort of impenetrable wall here at x equals zero, where the diffusing matter can only diffuse in one direction. So suppose that it can only diffuse in the positive x direction and not in the negative x direction. And what that means is that any atoms that would have hopped over to the left-hand side would reflect off of the wall and instead uh, diffuse in the positive x direction. And what this means is that we need to take our solution in this negative x space and reflect it into the positive x space and then add it to the solution that we already have in the positive x space. So that involves taking uh, this solution that we have here and multiplying by 2. So in other words, this 2 in the denominator goes away. And um, if diffusion is only allowed from this plane source in the positive x direction, then our solution is shown here. And plotted, you can see that it's just uh, you know, the same shape as on the previous slide, uh, but just twice the uh, magnitude, and it only applies to the positive x side. But, but still, if you integrate any of these curves, um, the integral would always be equal to the, the total concentration of the species m. So this method of reflection and superposition is just a, a simple uh, extension of the other solution. Now, the more realistic case is instead of having all of your initial species concentrated in a plane source, uh, the more realistic case is what if you have some extended initial distribution? For example, what if you've got um, your initial condition here at time equals zero is that you've got a constant concentration of the diffusing species equal to C0 in the negative x space, 
and then um, none of that diffusing species in the positive X space. Uh, for example, what if you have two different materials that were joined up together here, uh, where you've got, say, a constant concentration of one of the species here in one of them, and then an absence of that on the other side. So over time, the diffusing species is going to diffuse from the left-hand side here into the right-hand side um, into this other material. Now, how do we solve this? What we need to do is to take this extended initial distribution and break it up into really thin slabs and consider how much diffusing matter goes from each one of these thin slabs to some uh, position here, P, uh, uh, which is denoted here in the positive X space. So if we take a very thin slab that has a thickness of delta C, the amount of diffusing matter here uh, in this thin slab is equal to the concentration C0 times um, the width here, delta C. So what we can do is apply our Gaussian solution that we already know, and the amount of diffusing matter from that one really thin slab is C0 times delta C. So the M there becomes the C0 times delta C. And this is over two square root of pi dt, times e to the minus the distance this traveled, c squared over four dt. Note that this distance here, c is the distance from the slab to whatever the position is in the positive x space. So this is the contribution to this position, c uh, from just this one slab. And what we need to do then is to add up the contributions from all the slabs over this extended initial distribution. In other words, we need to integrate over all of this space, starting here at x equals zero and going all the way to minus infinity. So when we integrate over all space here, the minimum distance is the distance from x equals zero to this distance here, x. So the minimum distance is equal to x. And then we take this slab and we move it farther and farther away and the upper limit of this integral is therefore infinity. So we are integrating from some distance x to some distance uh, infinity, and we're integrating over all of these contributions, all of these Gaussian contributions from each one of those slabs. So each one of them is e to the minus c squared over four dt, and integrating over this c variable from x to infinity. Now, how do we do this integral? Um, as before, we need to make a substitution of variables where we can get the integral into a format, which is just e to the minus variable squared. So we need to make a substitution of variables. In this case, we're going to introduce a new variable here, eta, where eta is equal to c over two square root of d times time. And therefore, d eta is equal to one over uh, two times the square root of dt times d c. Now we make the substitution of the variable within the exponential function here, within the integrand, and that's what gives us e to the minus eta squared. Then we need to make the substitution of the differential, and you can see that this, you know, from this uh, equation that relates d eta and d c, that there's going to be a two times the square root of dt which cancels out the denominator here. So this is gonna come in as the numerator, cancel out in the denominator, and what we're left in the denominator is the square root of pi. Um, now we need to make the substitution in the limits of the integral. The lower limit of the integral here is x. So if we, if we put in the x for the c, you see that expressed in terms of eta, the lower limit of the integral is x over two times the square root of dt. Looking now at the upper limit of the integral, the upper limit is infinity. So if we put infinity in here for a c, the eta also goes to infinity. So this upper limit is unchanged. And what we have then is this expression for the concentration as a function of x and t, uh, which is c0 over the square root of pi, times now this integral over the Gaussian function with a finite lower limit and an infinite upper limit. And the solution to this integral um, 
is in the form of an error function. An error function is a standard function in probability and statistics, which is defined based on an integral of a Gaussian distribution. The error function is denoted here as ERF. Um, the error function of some variable z is defined as being 2 over the square root of pi times the integral from 0 to z, e to the minus eta squared over eta. And so this is just integrating over the Gaussian function between um, 0 and z. If we plot the error function as a function of the variable here, whether it's x or z, the error function has um, the form shown here, where at in the limit of minus infinity, it goes to 1, or sorry, minus 1. In the limit of plus infinity, the error function goes to 1, and it passes through the origin, and you can see that it has odd symmetry. So it has symmetry through the origin which means that the earth of minus z is equal to minus the earth of z. This is because of the odd symmetry. And it also has the properties that it goes through the origin. So the earth of zero is zero and the earth of infinity uh, goes to one. Now, there is another companion function to the error function, which is the complementary error function. And that is denoted as earth c. The complementary error function is defined as being 1 minus the error function. So it's 1 minus earth of z. And if we plot the complementary error function, you can see in this negative x space, um, 1 minus the minus 1 is 2 here in the negative domain. At x equals 0, it passes through 1. And then as you go to um, increasing amounts of x, the uh, complementary error function decays down and approaches zero. Now, um, we can rewrite this uh, complementary error function in terms of an integral by using our definition here of the error function. This is our definition of the error function, which has the integral from zero to z. Now, taking the number one here, another way of writing one is as the integral shown here, two over the square root of pi, integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus eta squared uh, integrated over eta. Remember before, if we have this uh, Gaussian function integrated from minus infinity to infinity, the integral would be equal to the square root of pi. And therefore, if we only have half of that integral from zero to infinity, this integral becomes the square root of pi over two. So the square root of pi over two cancels with this two over the square root of pi. And this is just a fancy way of writing one. Now, the reason we do this is if you look at the limits of the integral here, one is being integrated from zero to infinity, and the earth function is being integrated from zero to z. So subtracting out this part of the integral, what we're left with is just the integral from zero to infinity. So this goes, the one goes from zero to infinity minus zero to z, and what we're left with is the integral from z to infinity. And therefore, the definition of the complementary error function can also be expressed as 2 over the square root of pi times the integral from, from z to infinity uh, of e to the minus eta squared d eta. So this is the function that we need because the format of our solution um, for this extended initial distribution is um, in the form of an integral that has a finite lower bound and an infinite upper bound. So using this definition then of the complementary error function, we can see by comparing that to our solution for the concentration um, as a function of position x and time t, that we can write this in terms of the complementary error function as shown here. Um, where the two here in the definition of the complementary error function picks up this one half term here. The square roots of pi cancel out because that is built into the complementary error function. And what we have at the end is that our solution of the concentration as a function of x and t is equal to one half times c0 times the complementary error function of x over two times the square root of dt.
And this complement your error function is a standard function that is available in Excel and other plotting software. So it's very easy to just put in the RFC function and you can immediately plot the results to see what it looks like. So here we have um, results that show the normalized concentration here, C divided by C0 as a function of X. In the limit of zero time, this would be a, a really sharp interface between the negative x and positive x domains. And then as time increases, more and more um, diffusion occurs from uh, the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And this concentration profile that results is described by this complementary error function shape. So that is a really useful solution um, of the diffusion equation. But what happens now if instead of having a semi-infinite medium, what if we have a bounded initial distribution where rather than having the initial concentration C0 going from zero to minus infinity, what if it is contained uh, with bounds on either side? For example, what if we start with a constant concentration of C0, which is just between minus H and H? The approach for solving this bounded initial distribution is the same as what we just did, or what we're going to do is take this region, divide it up into very thin slabs, where each slab has a thickness of delta C. The contribution from each one of those elements is given here, exactly as before, where the amount of diffusing species from each of those elements is C0 times delta C and it travels some distance here, which is um, denoted as Cassie. Then what we need to do is integrate over all of the thin slabs within this bounded region. So that means integrating from the shortest distance that, that it travels, which would be the position here, x minus h. That would be the shortest distance from this position x to this right-hand boundary here, h. So that is the lower limit of the integral. And then the upper limit of the integral would be x minus the minus h. So in other words, x plus h. So this integral then becomes the integral from x minus h to x plus h, integrating over all of the contributions from each of those thin slabs. So again, we make the same substitution of variables as before introducing our new variable here, eta, uh, so we can write this integral in terms of e to the minus eta squared. Uh, we've got the same uh, change here for our differential to convert from the d c to the d eta. And um, the change, the difference is really in the limits of the integral. So the lower limit, x minus h, that becomes x minus h over two square root of dt when you convert from the c coordinate into the eta variable. Likewise, taking C equals x plus h, putting that into the numerator here, that gives you the upper limit of the integral, which is x plus h over the square root of two, or sorry, over two times the square root of dt. So now we've got finite, uh, a finite lower limit and a finite upper limit. And that can be expressed in terms of two error functions, where basically you've got the contribution on the positive side, the contribution on the negative side, and then adding that up gives you the summation of two error functions, where one of the error functions is h plus x over two times the square root of dt, and the other fun error function is h minus x over uh, two times the square root of dt. Of course, it's a lot easier to plot it to see what it looks like. And if you put this into Excel or another plotting software, what you can see is that the initial distribution has this sharp interface, just as we had defined in our problem. And then if you let the time increase over time, those both of those interfaces become more and more diffuse as more of the species diffuses out from the middle uh, into either uh, the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And um, this is just described using the summation of two error functions. Now, the next method that we're going to cover is um, kind of messy from a math mathematical point of view, but it is conceptually understand, uh, conceptually important, and this is a powerful method for solving differential equations, and that is the separation of variables method.
with the separation of variables method, you take the function, which is a function of two variables. In this case, the concentration is a function of the position x and the time t. And you write it as the product of two new functions, where those two new functions are only functions of one of those variables. So this new function, capital X, which is only a function of the position, and this new function, capital T, which is only a function of time. So writing C, of, which is a function of X of T, as a product of these two new functions, what we need to do is take this assumed form and plug it back into Fick's second law. So when we put um, the time derivative part in, note that the capital X function is a function of only the position and not time. So this is a constant with respect to time. It gets pulled in front of the time derivative. So the time derivative only operates on the capital T function. Likewise, taking this assumed form and putting it on the right-hand side of the equation, um, this derivative only operates on the position part. So the time-dependent piece is constant with respect to position. That gets pulled out in front. And the derivative operator acts only on the capital X function. Now, what we need to do is to rearrange the terms such that all the time-dependent piece is on one side of the equation. So dividing both, hands, both sides of the equation by uh, the capital T function gives us all the time-dependent piece on the left-hand side. And dividing both sides of the equation by the capital X function gives us all the X-dependence on the right-hand side. Now we know that both sides of the equation must be equal to each other. We also know that the left-hand side of the equation depends only on time and not position, and the right-hand side of the equation depends only on position, not on time. And since they're equal to each other and they depend on different variables, that means that both sides of the equation must be equal to a constant, and they must be equal to the same constant. And by convention, that constant is taken as minus lambda squared times the diffusion coefficient d. And so what we do is we take the left-hand side of the equation and set it equal to that constant. Then we take the right-hand side of the equation, set it equal to the same constant, where you can see that the diffusion coefficients have canceled from both sides of the equation. And these two differential equations have standard solutions now. So the solution to the capital T equation has the form of exponential minus lambda squared dt. The solution of the uh, position-dependent equation has the uh, trigonometric solution, where it's the summation of a sine term and a cosine term. And you can see that the reason why we chose this constant to be minus um, uh, lambda squared times d is that it lends itself to this trigonometric solution as well as the exponential solution for the time-dependent piece. And in order to get the concentration function, the concentration function is just the product of these two functions. So we take the product of the proposed solution, and that gives us then the format for the solution of the concentration as a function of x and t. And what we don't know are these unknown variables here, a and b. The other complication is that this is just the solution for one particular value of lambda. In other words, for one particular constant. The most general solution uh, involves summing up over all the solutions for all possible values of lambda. And so the most general solution uh, using the method of separation of variables is to sum up over all possible values of lambda that satisfy the equation. So summing up over n equals one through infinity, considering all possible values of lambda sub m with their corresponding constants a sub m and b sub m. And now what we're left to do is to figure out what the values of a, b, and lambda are for each of these um, possible solutions. And that involves applying the particular initial and boundary conditions for the problem. So this would be the general solution for the method of separation of variables. And to go to a specific solution, you need to apply the initial and boundary conditions. So if we consider just a test case, this is just for example, uh, what if you had at initial time, 
at time equals zero, a constant concentration of C equals C zero uh, over the uh, X space between zero and L. And what if you have boundary conditions where you hold um, the concentration equal to zero at both X equals zero and X equals L? What would be the solution in that particular case? Now, the method for figuring out these um, unknown coefficients is to apply um, apply the boundary conditions to a Fourier series representation of the function. Um, so the boundary conditions here demand that, um, that the B sub M is equal to zero. So what we're setting up here uh, is a problem that has an odd symmetry rather than an even symmetry. And that means that the even terms here, the cosine terms go to zero. And also because of um, having the concentration go to zero at zero and L, that is putting demands on our frequency term here, um, which will be given by uh, the lambda sub M, where that needs to be equal to M pi over L, where this L was just the, the thickness that defined our um, initial, uh, initial condition and boundary condition. And the initial condition, therefore, uh, if we plug in time equals zero, you see for time equals zero, this exponential term goes to one, the cosine term goes away, and therefore the initial condition uh, is simply given by this Fourier sine series shown here. As a reminder from um, either your differential equations class or uh, an advanced engineering class, um, a Fourier series is a general way for representing some function u of x that if it exists over some interval between minus l and l, we can express any function u of x uh, as a Fourier series, which involves writing it in terms of a constant plus a, an infinite summation of sine terms and cosine terms. Uh, where the coefficients for the sine terms are given by this integral. So this is the integral uh, over this um, uh, integral over this interval from minus L to L of the function that we want to express times the sine term integrated over that space. That gives us the coefficients for the sine term. Likewise, the coefficients for the cosine term are given by the integral of the product of that function with the cosine terms. And if you solve these integrals, you can get the values of the coefficients AM and the coefficients BM, and therefore have this Fourier series representation of your arbitrary function U of X. Now for special cases, if we have an odd function, if we have an odd function, then um, the cosine terms go away. All of those coefficients for an odd function would be zero for cosine, since cosine is an even function and the sine is an odd function. So for odd functions, the Fourier series becomes a Fourier sine series. Likewise, for even functions, the sine terms go away and all we're left with is the cosine terms to represent that even function. Now, applying this solution of separation of variables for our Fourier sine series, because in our case we have odd symmetry, uh, what we need to do is apply that boundary condition demanding that, um, that the concentration go to zero at both zero and L. And so we can use this um, function and apply our, our Fourier sine series formula to get our coefficients capital A sub M. Uh, which is shown here. And if we plug that into the final solution, then uh, we have a fairly messy um, equation here for the concentration as a function of position x and time t, which is an infinite sum over all of these terms. Um, so this is not necessarily the easiest thing to apply or not necessarily the most practical form, um, but it is, uh, it is sometimes a useful technique, especially if you have um, geometries in your diffusion problem that have periodicity. For example, if you've got repeated layers, maybe alternating thin films of materials A, B, A, B, A, B, um, it's often a lot easier to account for that periodicity using um, you know, Fourier sine or Fourier cosine series as appropriate with this separation of variables method. Uh, the separation of various variables method is also useful for, um, you know, more generally for solving differential equations, and it is something that we're going to come back to later in the course.
No. Um, let's get back to fixed second law here, our diffusion equation. Again, when we have a constant diffusion coefficient, this D gets pulled out in front. And if it is in one dimension, we have um, our simple form of fixed second law shown here at the bottom. Now, the next method that I want to introduce for solving fixed second law is the Laplace transform method. This is a really powerful approach for solving differential equations and a very useful approach for solving the diffusion equation. The Laplace transform method um, is it's based on performing a Laplace transform on the function that you're trying to solve. So the Laplace transform of some function f of x comma t is going to give us the Laplace transformed function f hat. So we can tell that this is a Laplace transform version of the function because it has a caret on top here. This f hat is a function of the same position coordinate x. So the Laplace transform does not change the position coordinate, but it does change the time coordinate to bring it into the Laplace domain. So this time function here, this time variable t, gets transformed into the Laplace domain and becomes this transformed variable p. The definition of the Laplace transform is that you take the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus pt, so this is e to the minus um, transformed variable times your initial variable, multiply that by the function that you wish to transform, f of x comma t, and then integrate over the time variable. And if you do this integration, this will convert from the t space into the p space. So it converts from a time domain into the Laplace domain. And the way this works is that we're going to solve the diffusion equation in the Laplace domain and then um, invert it back into the regular time domain. Um, so this Laplace transform method is a powerful technique for solving many partial differential equations. Let's see how it works on a few simple functions to get started. For example, the simplest possible function might be, what if f of t is equal to 1? What if it's equal to the constant equal to 1? If you put 1 in here for this function, then we just have the Laplace transform function is equal to integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus pt dt. Um, so this integral would be minus 1 over p times e to the minus pt evaluated then uh, between zero and infinity. So if we apply the upper limit here, e to the minus infinity, that goes to zero. So that first term is zero, and then we've got a minus uh, putting in the t equals zero where this goes to one. So this becomes a minus minus one over p. So the Laplace transform function of one is simply one over p. Next, what if you have the uh, function e to the at power? So if we put e to the at into um, this equation for f of t, then we can combine these exponentials. We get e to the minus p minus a times t. And then solving this integral, um, the Laplace transform is simply 1 over p minus a. Now, in practice, when we're using the Laplace transform method, we normally go to uh, Laplace transform tables, where we've got pairs of the initial function here and the Laplace transform of this function. If you look in the back of um, many math books, they will have these uh, Laplace transform tables, or if you Google them, there are many such tables available online. So as we already saw, if you have the initial function is 1, the Laplace transform of that function is 1 over p. If you have e to the minus at, the Laplace transform of that would be 1 over p plus a. Uh, a few other cases would be if you have a, a sine of omega t, the Laplace transform of that would be omega over p squared plus omega squared. For cosine, it takes a similar form, except the numerator becomes a p instead of the omega. The next one is one that we're going to use directly in our solution of the diffusion equation, where if, um, if you have a function which is a complementary error function, the Laplace transform is e to the minus qx over p, where this q here is defined as being the square root of p over d. 
Um, this is going to be a very useful one for us because what we're going to do when we solve the diffusion equation in the Laplace domain, we're going to obtain this solution here shown on the right, and then doing the inverse Laplace transform to bring it back into the, into the time domain gives us then this complementary error function solution. So this is one that we want to pay close attention to. Um, a few other Laplace transforms that are of interest. One is of a Gaussian function here that produces um, the Laplace transform shown on the right, which is very similar to the complementary error function, except instead of the P in the denominator, we get a Q in the denominator. Uh, here is another, uh, another one that comes up sometimes in diffusion problems. And finally, another one that is often useful is um, if you've got x to the n power, the Laplace transform of that is n factorial over p to the n plus 1 power. So why do we use the Laplace transform method? What makes it so powerful? Um, what makes it so powerful is how it gets applied to time derivatives. And let me show you how this works. What is the Laplace transform of the time derivative of some function f? So putting in the time derivative in for our function here, using the definition of the Laplace transform, the Laplace transform of the time derivative is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus pt times that time derivative, and then integrated over time. Okay. Now, in order to figure this out, we use something that goes back to your calculus class, and that is integration by parts. Remember that integration by parts is if you have an integral that has the form of the integral of some function u times the time derivative of some other function v integrated over time, this, using integration by parts, can be expressed as the product of those two functions, so u times v, minus the integral of that second function v times the time derivative of the first function u integrated over time. So let us apply this uh, integration by parts um, to this formula for the Laplace transform of the time derivative. And doing that, you see that um, the f function here corresponds to the v function, and this e to the minus pt corresponds to the u function. So this u times v is simply e to the minus pt times our function f. And since we've got um, a definite integral here with limits going from 0 to infinity, we need to apply those limits here of time going, going from 0 to infinity. Um, now, the second part of this equation using integration by parts is going to be minus the integral of v. So this is our uh, function here, f times the time derivative of our function u, taking the time derivative of e to the minus pt gives us a minus p, uh, e to the minus pt. So the minus the minus p gives us a plus p times the integral from 0 to infinity e to the minus pt times our function here f of x comma t integrated over time. Now, we can simplify this. Uh, first of all, let's take this first term here. We need to apply our limits. So if we apply time going to infinity, when you put an infinite time here to the exponential, this term goes to zero. And so what we're left with would be minus and then apply the initial condition of time equals zero. With t equals zero, this exponential goes to one, and this function here is just evaluated at time equals zero. So we have a minus function here, f, evaluated at time equals zero. So we've just automatically built in the initial condition into this formula, applying time equals one. Now, on the right-hand side, this should look very familiar to you. This is just the definition of the Laplace transform of this function f. So the right-hand side here is p times the Laplace transform of our initial function f, which means that the Laplace transform of the time derivative of f is just p times the Laplace transform of f minus that function f evaluated at uh, initial time t equals zero. So the beauty of this Laplace transform method is that it effectively eliminates the time derivative 
uh, and it automatically incorporates the initial condition here at time equals zero. And if you apply the Laplace transform to your spatial derivatives, because the Laplace transform is not changing the spatial coordinates, the nth partial derivative with respect to the spatial coordinate is just equal to the nth partial derivative of the Laplace transform function with respect to that same spatial derivative. So let's see how this works on an example problem. What if we have a setup where we have um, some concentration here of C0 at x equals zero? And so at time equals zero, uh, we have the initial condition that the concentration is zero for all x greater than or equal to zero, and that the concentration at the boundary here, the concentration at x equals zero, is held constant at C equals zero for all time. And so this would be, for example, if you have a material that is in um, some sort, sort of environment where there is a constant supply of diffusing species that holds a constant concentration then of C0 at the boundary. And we need one more boundary condition to solve the problem, which is that the slope of the concentration curve and the limit of infinite x goes to zero. So using these initial and boundary conditions, let us apply the Laplace transform method to come up with a solution for this diffusion problem. Um, to apply this Laplace transform method, what we need to do is take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation that we're trying to solve. So we're gonna take the Laplace transform of the left-hand side, which is the time derivative, the Laplace transform of the right-hand side, which is the spatial derivative, we're going to solve the equation in the Laplace transform space. And then when we get to the solution in the Laplace space, we're going to use our table of Laplace transforms to do an inverse Laplace transform to bring it back into the time domain. So the first step is to apply the Laplace transform to both sides of the equation. When we apply the Laplace transform to the time derivative on the left-hand side of the equation, that gives us, as we just saw using integration by parts, that gives us p times the Laplace transformed variable here, so the c hat, minus our initial function here, the concentration evaluated at the initial time t equals zero. So the time derivative has just disappeared by taking the Laplace transform and we've automatically built in this initial condition into the equation. Now on the right-hand side, when we take the Laplace transform of the second spatial derivative, that is just um, the second spatial derivative of the Laplace transform function there. Um, so the right-hand side is also simple. Uh, now, going forward, we take this equation here, and we want to um, basically bring everything over to uh, one side of the equation, and uh, so we can set that equal to zero. Also, applying here the uh, initial condition that um, you know the concentration at any position x greater than greater than zero at the initial time is equal to zero. So that initial condition uh, gets incorporated here into this function, setting everything equal to zero. So this is the equation now that we want to solve. Um, this is only uh, a derivative here with respect to x. There's no, uh, no more time dependence there. And so this is a standard differential equation that has a standard solution as a summation of uh, two exponential terms that are e to the plus or minus square root of p over d times x. And then there would be two unknown coefficients that are out in front of the positive case and the negative case. So these a1 and a2 prefactors that need to be determined. Uh, in order to determine those two unknown coefficients, we have to apply the boundary conditions. And since we are in the Laplace space here, this is a function of p, not t, we need to transform the boundary conditions into the Laplace domain. And so applying the Laplace transform to our boundary conditions, the first boundary condition is that the c is equal to a constant c0 at x equals zero. So if we apply that, that means that the uh, Laplace transform at x equals zero Applying the Laplace transform, we know that the Laplace transform of 1 is just 1 over p, 
which means the Laplace transform of a constant, C0, is just that constant C0 divided by P. So this is our um, boundary condition at x equals 0. The other boundary condition that we have is that the slope of the concentration with respect to x is equal to 0 in the limit of uh, x going to infinity. Um, of course, the, uh, the spatial derivative here is just the spatial derivative of the Laplace transformed function. So we just apply that to the same x space. So that is very straightforward and also equal to 0. Now let's apply these two um, boundary conditions in the Laplace transform space to our solution of the equation here in our Laplace domain. The first thing that we can note is that if we apply this second boundary condition where x goes to infinity, notice x goes to infinity, this term would blow up and therefore the a1 has to be equal to zero in order to satisfy this boundary condition of this slope going to zero in the limit of x going to infinity. So application of the second boundary condition uh, eliminates the first term from this equation. In order to solve for a2, we apply this first boundary condition here, which is where x equals zero. So where x equals zero here, this exponential term goes to one, which means that the a2 is just equal to c0 over p. And applying that then, our um, solution here in the Laplace domain is that the Laplace transformed function of the concentration c hat of x comma p is equal to this c0 over p times e to the minus square root of p over d x. Now this um, is the solution in the Laplace domain. The next step is to perform an inverse Laplace transform to bring that back into the time domain. So we go back to our um, table of Laplace transform pairs and see that our Laplace transform solution has the functional form shown here on the right, uh, where this Q here is defined as being the square root of P over D. And now taking the inverse Laplace transform uh, means going from the right-hand side over to the left-hand side. So we apply our inverse Laplace transform to our solution in the Laplace domain. And what we recover is that the concentration back in the time domain is equal to C0 times the complementary error function of x over the square root of 4 dt. So that was a really elegant way of um, obtaining this solution in the time domain by performing the Laplace transform on both sides of the equation, solving in the Laplace domain, and then applying the inverse Laplace transform to get back into the time domain. The advantage of this method is that it eliminates the time derivative from the equation and automatically incorporates the uh, initial condition. And then you apply the boundary conditions in the Laplace domain to get the final solution. So here's our final solution back in the time domain, and it is plotted here over on the right. You can see that following the boundary condition of a constant concentration of C0 at x equals 0, that this concentration is always held constant here at x equals 0. And then as time increases, more and more of the diffusing species is penetrating into uh, the material in the positive x space. This is one of the most common solutions that we use for the diffusion equation. Um, so you know, make sure that you are comfortable with that solution as well as the method for obtaining that solution. Now, in the last part of the lecture, I'm going to deal with a few special cases. Uh, up to this point, we have assumed that diffusion was isotropic, meaning that the diffusivity would be the same in any direction, whether the diffusion is happening in the x direction, the y direction, or the z direction. You know, we had assumed that it would be the same. Um, what if the diffusion is anisotropic? Um, this, for example, in many single crystals, um, depending upon how uh, the unit cell is, it, it will be likely different along different directions, which means that uh, the rate of diffusion would be different along different directions. Uh, so this would be a case of anisotropic diffusion. And um, the way to set this up is considering here, uh, let's take Fick's first law of the flux equation, that if we have the flux along these different directions here, x sub i, 
writing it in, a, in an anisotropic form means that we've got the flux along three directions here, J1, J2, and J2, and J3, would be equal to now uh, minus a diffusivity matrix. This is a three by three diffusivity matrix um, times the concentration profiles along each of the X1, X2, and X3 directions. The way to solve the equation like this is to diagonalize this matrix um, because diagonalizing the matrix causes the off-diagonal terms to be zero, and that allows us to solve the equation independently along each of the three uh, dimensions. But in order to do that, we need to um, transform this um, coordinate system to a different coordinate, coordinate system that would eliminate the off-diagonal terms. So what we need to do is take this diffusivity matrix um, and then transform it into this diagonalized version of the diffusivity matrix to eliminate the interactions between um, different directions. Um, so to do that, we need to solve the eigenvector eigenvalue problem, which means that you take our, in this case, three by three matrix, and along the diagonal, subtract the eigenvalues here, lambda, taking the determinant of that matrix and setting it equal to zero, allows you to solve for these eigenvalues, uh, lambda, for a three by three matrix that will give you three different eigenvalues. Um, that correspond to the three roots of this equation. Um, and obtaining them, that gives you the eigenvector column matrices. And performing this um, matrix mathematics here, taking your initial square matrix and multiplying it by the inverse of the eigenvector column matrix and the eigenvector column matrix gives you the um, diagonalized matrix. And physically what is happening here is that we are taking our initial coordinate system of x1, x2, and x3 and transforming it to a new coordinate system uh, called the principal axes. What we're doing is first finding the principal components of the system. So it's a new set of coordinates, x hat one, x hat two, and x hat three that are all mutually orthogonal to each other but tilted in such a way that it eliminates interactions among these axes. And once we've eliminated the interactions, then we can solve the diffusion equation independently along each of these new coordinate systems, x hat one, x hat two, and x hat three, applying the same solutions that we have already derived. So the eigenvector of column matrix defines the principal ax axes. Um, and then the diffusion equation can be expressed in principal coordinate system uh, where you've got independent terms in the x hat one, x hat two, and x hat three directions. Now we'll be getting into more details about how to solve um, this matrix type of equation in the next chapter. Uh, the next chapter deals with multi-component diffusion, which also involves a matrix formulation converting to a principal component space to eliminate the off-diagonal terms and then solving the equation. So we'll have more details about this in chapter five. Uh, the next special case is what happens if diffusivity is a function of concentration. So what if your diffusion coefficient here, D, changes as a function of concentration, C? In that case, we need to go back to our general form of fixed second law, where the partial of C with respect to time is equal to this divergence operator acting on the product of diffusion, which is now a function of concentration C, with the gradient, um, the, the gradient operator acting on the concentration. And so this is mathematically more complicated and would usually need to be uh, solved numerically. But the way it works is that one would need to apply, let's consider this in one dimension here. If you've got uh, the partial of C with respect to T is equal to, now in one spatial dimension, the, the partial derivative operator with respect to X, this needs to be applied to the product of the diffusivity um, as, as a function of C times the partial of C with respect to X. So we need to apply the product rule here, which means taking um, the first function here, D of C, 
multiplying by the derivative of the second one, which gives us the second derivative of the concentration, and then times the um, second function multiplied by the derivative of the first. And this derivative of the d with respect to x can then be expanded as the derivative of d with respect to c times the derivative of c with respect to x. And then you've got two partial derivatives of c with respect to x. So this gives you a squared term here. And so accounting for the concentration dependent diffusivity, you've got that diffusivity um, function times the second derivative of concentration with respect to x. This is the normal part that we get in our diffusion equation, but then there is an additional nonlinear term, uh, which is the second term shown here, that accounts for the concentration dependence of the diffusivity. So this often makes it um, very difficult, if not impossible, to solve analytically. And um, if you're unable to solve it analytically, you can go to numerical solutions, which is what we are going to cover in chapter six. Uh, the next special case is diffusivity as a function of time. For example, if the temperature of your system is evolving, and we know that the diffusion coefficient scales erroneously with temperature, then that means that the, the um, evolution of temperature would mean that the diffusion coefficient is also a function of time. So if we put the diffusion coefficient as a function of time into fixed second law, this divergence operator is only operating on the spatial coordinates, not the time coordinate. And so this d of t can be pulled out in front, giving us the, the usual Laplacian operator here. Now, the key to solving um, diffusivity as a function of time is to make a change of variables where you define a new effective diffusion time variable, uh, tau, sub d, tau sub d, which is defined as being the integral from 0 to t of your diffusion function here. So this is the diffusivity uh, as a function of some dummy time variable t prime integrated over t prime from the initial time zero to the current time t. And this effectively gives you a diffusion time that accounts for the evolution of the diffusivity as a function of time. Then what we need to do is to take the time derivative uh, in a fixed second law, so this partial derivative of concentration with respect to time, expand this out so it is a, uh, expressed in terms of derivatives with respect to this new time variable tau d, so it becomes the partial of c with respect to tau d times the partial of tau d with respect to time. Using our definition of tau d, this derivative is simply our diffusion, um, our diffusivity as a function of time. And so now applying this to um, our expression here for a fixed second law, um, this you know, time derivative piece is equal to this. So we put this here on the left-hand side of the equation. The diffusion, the diffusivity as a function of time on the left-hand side cancels with the d of t function on the right-hand side. And that's, that is because we've built in that, that diffusivity into this transformed coordinate here, tau sub, tau sub d. And so we get a simplified version of fixed second law, which is the partial of c with respect to tau d is equal to the Laplacian of the concentration c. Now with this formulation of the equation, um, what we need to do is consider of what are the initial and boundary conditions of the problem. And then we can apply the solutions that we've already obtained. So the, the solution for the constant diffusivity case, take that functional form and wherever we see dt in that functional form, replace it with our definition of the um, effective uh, diffusion time here, tau sub d. For example, if we take our solution that we just obtained, uh, using the Laplace transform method. Um, if we've got our solution from the Laplace transform method um, where the diffusivity is now a function of time, where we previously had square root of 4 dt in the denominator, that dt gets replaced by this effective diffusion time tau sub d. Using the definition of tau sub, tau sub d, the final equation is um, simply c0 times the complementary error function of x over the square root of 4 
an integral from zero to t d of t prime um, integrated over t prime. And depending upon what this functional form looks like, you may be able to solve that integral analytically and put that analytical solution in your final form. So time-dependent diffusivity is quite a bit simpler compared to concentration-dependent diffusivity. Lastly, if you have a different coordinate system, um, for example, if you have a cylindrical coordinate system, you just need to apply the um, formulation of the Laplacian operator for that coordinate system. So the Laplacian operator um, in the cylindrical coordinate system would be a function here of the radius r, um, the angle here theta, and then the same z coordinate as we had before. So this z term stays the same, but the x and y terms are now expressed in terms of r and theta. And that gives you this formulation of fixed second law in cylindrical coordinates. Um, depending upon the conditions, this could be solved analytically or numerically. And likewise, for spherical coordinates, we apply the spherical version of the Laplacian operator, which is now in terms of the radius r and two angles here, uh, theta and phi. And uh, of course, this is more complicated than solving in Cartesian space, but sometimes the geometry of the problem naturally lends itself to cylindrical or spherical coordinates. So to summarize, we've covered several analytical approaches for solving the diffusion equation, including a Gaussian solution, a method of, of reflection and superposition. We covered error function solutions uh, using substitution of variables. We covered a separation of variables method, which leads to Fourier um, solutions. We also covered the Laplace transform method. Um, and we did some special cases of anisotropic diffusion, concentration-dependent and time-dependent diffusivities, and how to write the diffusion equation in different coordinate systems. Um, so I hope that was all helpful. Please you know, feel free to put any questions that you have in the comments, and I'm going to um, stop recording.